Yes, okay, great. Um, warm. Thank you once again to Jorgos Constantino, the great um, artist behind um, a visual summary of, um, I think, a very um, interesting and indeed a lot of food for thought um, first panel we had this morning. Now, welcome back. We have, after um, the many challenges we, we discussed and, and um, touched upon in the first panel now, um, the honor of having four wonderful panelists with us to look into the options on how to tackle these challenges a little bit. So let's um, look into different avenues, look at different levels, um, opportunities, and hopefully get some ideas and inspirations for all of us because we don't want you, we don't want to leave you uh, with dark and gloomy challenges only, but also make sure that um, you get some food for thought on how to uh, become engaged. I know most of you already are, but maybe also how to, um, how we can better um, counter um, the far right and the challenges we have. So a warm welcome to my panelists on the panel and online. Um, we have Milena Zajovic with us, actually wearing a couple of hats. Milena is a psychologist, a journalist and human rights defender, quite an active one. Uh, Milena, you organized uh, the first gay pride in Croatia already in 2002, um, co-led a first um, Croatian LGBT organization and started becoming active in the field of migration and asylum really um, for some years since 2015. You have led um, the NGO Are You Serious, which I know many of you here in the room know. And you have served as head of advocacy of the Border Violence Monitoring Network, which is also a long-standing partner of Heinrich Bell Foundation. So um, in that role also um, consulting with European institutions, the parliament, the council, um, co-authored the, the black books uh, of pushbacks, um, collecting testimonies, over 25,000 um, by now, of people on the move um, experiencing violence at our borders. Um, so very much connected to what we heard from you, Petra, on the first panel. Um, thanks for being with us and a warm welcome. Then we have... <laughs> we are happy to have Tiago da Cruz Bartolo with us today as coordinator of the network from the sea to the city. Tiago, like myself, is a political scientist, so maybe to this second panel is the political scientist panel, we will see, um, with an MA in critical geography as well. You are interested in exploring alternative institutional models, which we will talk about later. And uh, you have dedicated um, many years um, of your professional career to different civil society organizations, um, Alarm Phone being one of them, but also to ecologist organizations such as Ecologists in Action. A warm welcome to you as well, Tiago. From Athens, we have Stefanos uh, Lukopoulos with us, who is the co-founder of Vuliwatch and director of Vuliwatch. Vuliwatch is a transparency and democracy watchdog organization. Um, but before that, uh, Stefanos gained extensive experience um, in the NGO sector as well, in London, in Brussels, but also having worked with the parliament um, like really gained knowledge on both sides, let's say, um, of, of the political uh, field. Um, and last but not least, we have with us uh, Parastu Hakim, unfortunately online. Um, Parastu is the founder of SRAC Underground Schools um, and the founder of an online university in Afghanistan. Um, Parastu has started the schools in September 2021 and as most of you in the room probably remember, we had the brutal seizure of the Taliban in Afghanistan in August 2021, so only weeks later. Um, she bravely started um, her own uh, network and organizations, um, making sure that despite girls being banned from public school, 
there is a network of teachers continuing schooling. So in that sense, um, an activist as well and a founder of an organization. Warm welcome, unfortunately not in the room with us. Hi everyone. Um, we would also like to give you the floor for some initial statements because I really managed to only briefly introduce you but to also tell us a little bit about your background starting with Milena. So, thanks. Thank you. I think you covered uh, my background extensively uh, and I also like to avoid talking about myself too much. Uh, I would rather react to some things that were said in the previous panel and especially the points that came from the audience which I found very interesting. And since uh, these sort of panels are usually the best platforms for white people with European passports to share their academic knowledge, I would like to start by saying that in information theory, there is a difference between something that is called lay argument and technocrat argument. So lay argument is something that is considered uh, coming you know, from the real experience of people, which is simplistic, appealing to emotion something the right wing is doing quite well. On the other side, you have technocrat argument, things such as uh, you know, data-driven, academically-driven knowledge, which is something that we like to resort to. When I say we, I mean like left and the green political options. So when we are doing this, we say that uh, we are holding higher ground. But my fear is that we are actually, by doing so, losing ground. Uh, because while we are well, while the right wing, for example, is speaking about uh, defending the border, we are speaking about intersectionality and securitization and stuff like that. And this is how we are falling out of this information mill between uh, the politics, the media and the people. And when we are becoming aware that we are falling out because our messages don't translate very well, then we start shying away from the topic of migration. And I think this is what we saw in the pre-election campaign, speaking of the Greens, but speaking also of the other options that are maybe more connected to our values. And when we are speaking uh, of such topics, we fall into trap too often of mystifying the peril of the people on the move. And while doing that, I am afraid that we are contributing to othering of the people we are talking about because we forget that migration rights, our women's rights, our labor rights are related to climate crisis, to housing crisis, things that resonate very well with the general audience and the voters. And I would also like to point out that elections are not cerebral activity, they're emotional activity. I think very few of us sat, compared all the programs of political parties and then decided for whom we are going to vote. So in that regard, I think the right is doing right and we have a lot to learn from them. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the Rangersberg Stiftung. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, have a quick background on uh, what From the City from the city to the City is, um, which is not an established organization, but rather a movement of organizations that gather in a certain context to counter uh, these uh, restrictive migration policies. Um, restrictive back then, now it's just gore, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I am myself an activist of Alarm Phone. Uh, Alarm Phone, for those of you who don't know it, is an organization that uh, takes phone calls from people who are uh, in uh, imminent danger um, while uh, crossing borders and uh, we um, alert the competent authorities and uh, NGOs that are active in the regions um, to rescue them, uh, building up pressure and scandalizing if authorities don't <laughs> respond. Uh, I joined from the city to the city as an activist of Alarm Phone. Uh, I started collaborated uh, in the consortium uh, as such. Um, and uh, uh, from the city to the city, as I said, is a movement, just like Alarm Phone, many other organizations are part of it, uh, Sea Rescue, but also um, 
also orga uh, organizations that are doing important work in different cities um, across uh, Europe uh, to, for the participation, so social cultural participation of migrants uh, in different territories uh, and also researchers. Um, there is one thing that was very inspiring for this consortium, which was the Palermo Charter uh, from the mayor of Palermo, uh, advocating for freedom of movement and uh, local citizenship. So basically citizens, citizenship rights to uh, people on the move in different uh, local realities. Um, and from that inspiring document, we um, uh, th there was this uh, Palermo Charter platform process uh, that was uh, developed. So it was an articulation process of these organizations that coincided um, with Salvini's closed harbor policy. So in a way, it can also be read as a, as a response to this. And the idea behind it was uh, to create transnational uh, corridors of projects and um, spaces of solidarity at local level, which then, of course, um, included uh, municipal authorities. Uh, with this vision, uh, the work with municipal authorities became one key axis of uh, from the city to the city's work. Um, until the foundation of IASH, which is the International Alliance of Safe Harbors, uh, created in 2021 in Palermo also. Uh, so as a movement, uh, co the context matters. Uh, the context back then, this I'm talking about 2015, the Palermo Charter on. Um, the con context back then was uh, deterrence strategies through uh, sea rescue uh, barriers. Um, it has changed since then. This continues and it became worse, as we all know. Uh, but externalization, uh, not only to third uh, countries in uh, Africa, but also in, in, um, in um, Lebanon, for example, um, but also within Europe, um, normalized necropolitics, widespread discourse criminalizing migration uh, are affecting societies in ways that we can already see namely the rise of the ultra-right. Um, so one important aspect which I wanted to highlight in this introduction is that um, From the City to the City is not uniquely a civil society movement, uh, but there is an underlying proposal here, um, which I think will be uh, probably a, a, a good contribution to the debate um, because the, this idea of creating corridors with uh, local authorities and their local realities um, was also um, a tool to work against national states as a nativist container from within. So local authorities being state actors. Um, and also beyond the national state, because they created a transnational alliance of uh, cities. So it's really, uh, from a political theoretical perspective, it's really working from within the state with state actors and beyond the state, creating an alliance that one of the goals that we had was to, um, was to uh, turn IASH into a political actor capable of uh, interlocutor, inter, uh, well, speaking to EU actors. And just to finish, uh, I think the discussions are too focused on electoral and national politics. We saw this also uh, today. We were talking about electoral results and electoral uh, dynamics. Um, and as a proposal or an invitation, I would like uh, to invite you to think of transnational politics away from toxic uh, policies, not politics, transnational policies as opposed to toxic politics as a functional approach to, to overcome fake nationalism, in my opinion. Thank you.
Thank you, Tiago. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for the very kind invitation. It's always a pleasure being in Thessaloniki, uh, although I can't stand the humidity. Um, but, you know, you can't have it all. Now, um, I would have, I must confess that I would have rather be in the previous panel because given my old age, I mean, I'm not, it looks deceived, uh, plus 10 years of working with, uh, within the Greek political system, corruption, lack of transparency, it tends to like age your soul at least, if not your body. So I, this whole process have, has turned me into a sort of grumpy uh, pessimist. So I would have much rather like complain about, um, about how shit everything is, sorry. Um, and um, you know, rather than trying to find solutions, um, but I'll try and do both because I think that you cannot um, you cannot find the solution if you don't know exactly what the problem is, um, and uh, you can't face a problem if you don't know what this problem looks like. Um, in my view, um, the main issue that we are facing today in the West, in inverted commas, in established democracies, um, is the fact that. Um, around 20 years of um, you know, uh, political um, and economic uh, approaches have, um, to an extent, rendered a vast, have created vast uh, inequalities. Um, they've created uh, vast inequalities among citizens within Western uh, affluent um, uh, economies. And uh, it, it is a system that uh, is uh, promoting individualism over collectivism. Um, it is a system that is um, promoting gain, f gains, financial gains for the sake of financial gains without taking into consideration the repercussions that these gains may have on you know, the social fabric or the environment or God knows what. So basically, uh, what has been happening over the last few years is that politics has been distancing itself from the polis, from the people. And it's serving, uh, I, would, I would argue, um, a very small uh, minority of, 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 this, uh, of this world. Um, so yes, I'm talking about an elephant in the room. Uh, there is an elephant in the room. No one, no one wants to uh, openly say what this elephant in the room is, um, whether you're in, in a lefty or green or centrist or right wing or whatever uh, gathering no one will you know name this it's a c word i don't know if you're allowed to to say it. it's a c word it's capitalism it's modern day capitalism i mean i know that it might i might sound like a washed out marxist or i don't know what um you may judge me as you want um but this is my uh, my opinion it is this new form of capitalism that we have been experiencing over the last over the last years that has alienated people from politics that has alienated politics from from people and unless we decide to to face it and do something about it i'm not calling for a call to arms obviously i'll, I'll get back to the solutions in a bit um, unless we do something about it, all we'll be doing in forums like these ones, in organizations such as mine or such as the, the, the ones that the guys work, would be to apply plasters on, on a festering uh, wound. That has no, will have no effect. And then we'll be wondering why populism is rising. Why are uh, you know, the fascists on the rise? Uh, why our societies are becoming, uh, are, 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 have autarkic tendencies? Um, well, that's because people are super disappointed by the political system that was placed there, supposedly to advance their interests. That's, that's the reason. It's not rocket science. So we need, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a solution. If I had the solution, I, I would probably wouldn't be sitting here with you today. But I think, the, the way I see it in the long term, what we need to do is to not really reinvent politics, but go back to the origins of what democracy, what the democratic values are, and, of, and what the values of the so-called rule of law and human rights are. We don't need to reinvent anything. We need to reinvent, however, the trust that has been broken between 
citizens and the political um, system, the political elite. So that they won't you know, go f and vote for random charlatans that promise uh, things that are not uh, feasible and that uh, you know, are not positive for democratic systems of governance. And how do you create this trust? How do you build how do you build uh, and, and, and uh, fill the gap that has been created over the last years? I mean, what we do at Vuli Watch is, you know, uh, our theory of change, if you like, goes along these lines. Firstly, in order to create, firstly, you need to take into account what democracy is. Let's take it from the top. Democracy should not be seen as a uh, or uh, as, a, as, as a mass, as a stone, as a rock, as, as something tangible that fell off the sky and came here one day and said, okay, this is it, now we've got democracy, that's it, let's go, autopilot, carry on. No, democracy is a concept, democracy is an idea, democracy is organic, democracy is like a plant that needs the sea, eh, that needs the water, that needs the sun, and that needs care and affection. Now, when we stop caring uh, and tending to democracy as, as, as a society, then it's going to start to shrivel. Democracy doesn't mean voting once every four years. Democracy means being an active citizen, which means being active in the commons, um, applying pressure to your members of parliament, um, monitoring their work, uh, judging them properly and not judging them on, on the merit of, you know, if they're going to help you in the future with uh, some family member or I don't know what, nepotism. Um, so, the best way to achieve this, the best way to sort of start bridging um, uh, this gap and start feeding democracy again, is through the creation of trust. And the creation of trust can only be achieved through more transparency, more accountability, more, um, more uh, chances for citizens to have their voice heard at the decision-making level. These things are not hard to happen, like uh, civic technology, technologies in general are there and they can help us, they can help reimagine, reinvent actually um, uh, democracy. Um, a democracy that's going to be more participatory, a democracy that's going to be more um, transparent and politicians that are going to be more accountable. There are tools to do that. What is lacking is a political will. The political will will come though once citizens start demanding this. So the best thing we can do is carry on. Uh, not uh, Definitely don't become pessimists and cynics as, as I am starting to become, but carry on being dreamers um, and, and carry on fighting the good fight until uh, you know, we, we, we convince people around us that we deserve a better, a better um, democratic system of governance. I think I went far away uh, sorry if i confused you but but, but uh, you gave us the perfect um, the perfect uh, handover also, or why, bridge to why aren't i getting any uh, claps <laughs> i'm sorry i didn't get one during my introduction so i was like <laughs> fishing for claps now um, thank you stefanos i think this was actually an excellent bridge to to Parastu, who will join us um, online because she actually is a woman having started to engage for democracy in her very own way. So warm welcome to you online with you uh, with us, uh, Parastu. Unfortunately, um, you cannot be with us here in the room. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Parastu on two panels already, and um, I was um, highly. Um, highly inspired um, by your work and what you did and we would have loved to have her here with us but um, being a refugee and going through the experience of being um, as an accepted refugee in Europe may also mean that um, you have mobility restrictions and um, this is part of the reality that um, also people who have um, the privilege and it's not a privilege as we know but you know who are 
who have managed to arrive safely in Europe and having gone through a legal process being accepted as refugees might still have bureaucratic hurdles traveling from one place to another and this is also something that just needs to be um, highlighted and, and made visible, um, I think, here in this forum. So thanks for joining us online. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you guys can see me, but uh, I can't see any of you. Um, I'm not sure if we it's see you. We going see to you. be... Okay. So I will just speak with, with myself because I just see myself here. So um, good morning. I think it's morning or good noon, everyone. And uh, thank you very much for having me. It's really a honor for, to, to be here and to, to speak in such a great platform with those amazing voices in it. Thank you, and I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have to say that with those amazing people that we have in the panel, they, they were just they were talking about the solutions and things, and I found myself the problem because I am a refugee. So I was thinking that are they talking about like me? I am am I the problem or it is about me? So uh, you know I. Uh, but first of all, as, as she said again, my name is Parathur Hakim and I was born as a refugee in, in Pakistan in 1996 when the Taliban was in my country. Unfortunately, I, I don't know how it's it to be born and to say that my birth country is also Afghanistan while I am from Afghanistan. And then uh, shortly after that, I left back to Afghanistan while the war was still going on. I studied everything in Afghanistan and after 20 years uh, uh, I, I came back to the same age which is I am a refugee again so in my country I was not accepted as a woman because uh, those people have imprisoned millions of people and humans at home because just because they are not men so uh, we came here and now they are calling us refugees so I think it's always a name tag on, on me, on us, on all of the, the people that they have been misguided, misleaded, misplaced because of the wrong decisions of the policymakers, the world leaders and the politicians today. The situation in the world is really disappointing, especially according to uh, one of our uh, panelists that they said like, we have to pro we have to be proud to, to be like I'm, I'm I'm not sure we spoke about democracy but we didn't his we didn't really use the power that we have to take the world to uh, a better way to lead the world to a better place and uh, today I am in a situation that I do not have the right to have my own house I do not have the right to travel I do not have the right to work right now. And with all these connections the, that I had with my land, it is gone. And I have to start my life from zero here. But in the same time, I have to face discrimination. I have to be uh, judged and bullied for not uh, being able to speak their own language. I have, uh, when, when I came first, I was in one of the uh, governmental offices in this country. And because I was so traumatized, so I have these dark circles under my eyes and uh, I was so traumatized and sad and the people sat me from 8 in the morning till 4 p.m. in the afternoon without any food and anything because they thought that I am maybe addicted or in the same time maybe they thought that I look like a criminal people so they wanted to assist my behavior on how do I behave and I was so calm and then they did a medical checkups without my uh, without my consent. I didn't know. I thought it's also part of the, pro the, the process of, of the interview in, in one of those governmental offices after the interview for immigration. But then shortly after I got out of there, when the other person went there, she was from Kurdistan, Iraq, she went and her interview got at, at least like 13 minutes and 14 minutes. And I asked her that they did these things to me and she said like, no, they didn't do it to me. So next time when I went there, I asked them, why did you do the medical checkups to me? Why did you ask me to stay here a whole day without eating anything? So they told me that because you were looking uh, like you are sick, you are um, addicted to something, we wanted to see your behavior according to your behavior, we are going to decide about you. So imagine, I have been traumatized, but all the things happen in my country and the work that I have been doing and being under the, uh, the, the uh, 
war uh, criminal people in the leadership of, of my my country. I could not be like a green and white, and uh, I, I, my face could not be as it is right now. My my hairs, I cannot change its color. It is how I am, and. I was not acceptable in my country back then, and here also I have been questioned. Yes, they are very nice in many situations. This is the place that I have called home the first day I have arrived here. But I have so many problems that I am, I have to, I'm obliged to be silent about it and just to silent suffer kind of thing because I am an immigrant. If I say anything, they will just tell me that, oh, you are the person who is taking our tax monies, while I don't even know that where am I standing in this position. So anyways, uh, I'm working on uh, secret schools uh, in Afghanistan uh, from 2021 in September, shortly after the Taliban came. And we have more than 1,000 girls right now in our platforms that they are studying with us in secret schools. And uh, we have made some small businesses for them so that they can support themselves and their families to escape uh, being forced for marriages. And because women are not right now, girls are right now being forced for marriages. Just one week uh, before we had a girl, she was 15 years old and she was forced for a marriage. But she's still coming to our school because she had the eager to education. Uh, the Taliban right now has done... Uh, they are just ruling a kind of gender apartheid, but nobody is really speaking about it. We right now are protesting all over the Europe and we are asking the governments to at least speak about gender apartheid in Afghanistan. Believe me, if the countries here and the countries that they are speaking very highly about democracy and freedom, they speak about what bad things and um, uh, the human rights violations is happening in our country, we would not have been here. If they decided the good decisions, if they would have taken good policies undertaken and about our countries, we would have never choose to be an immigrant. Not because I don't love this country, I love it with all my uh, like body and soul, but I really wanted to be here under other circumstances. I wanted to come here as a student, I wanted to come here as a tourist, I wanted to come here to attend some conferences and go back to my country. We have, like right now, you have a chair, an empty chair of me in this platform. We have millions of chairs right now in the schools in, inside Afghanistan that women are not allowed to go and sit there to work, to study in university, to sit in there in the schools to study because because they are women, you know. So let's stand together. Let's let's question our policymakers. Being a refugee is really not our pleasurous choice, and we are trying our best to put ourselves in the shape of the rules of this government, and we respect it a lot, we accepted it as our country, you also accept that. And if tomorrow our country is free again, and because uh, the policymakers, politicians, and everybody in, in, in uh, the leadership uh, took the right decisions, I will be the first person who will take the tickets and go back to my country because nobody wants to be stay, stay away from their favorite foods, their mother's love, and their family's love. Thank you. سلام اسم ما آرزو است و در مکتب سرک درست می خانم و از یک سنف هفت هستم نمیتونم مکتب برم و نمیتونم درس بخونم و نمیتونم تحصیل کنم ولی وقتی که من مکتب میم بسیار خوشحال میشم و در این کورس که میاییم بسیار خوشحال میشم درس بخونم و پیشرفت کنم برای آنده خود یک شا... فرد یا یک شخص مفید باشم و, و هیچ چیزی جای مکتب مارو گرفته نمیتونه ای که ما مکتب میریم تحصیل میکنیم ولی از یک خوشحال هستم که مکتب میرم و میخوان دا آنده خود یک انجینیر خوب شوم و به خاطر انجینیر شدن باید ما درس خوب بخونم
از جهانیان از طالبان فقط دیری میخواییم که مرتبا ما رو باز کنه هیچ وقت مانه تحصیلی ما نشه چون ما دخترها یا خانمها نسبه از جامعه رو میسازیم پس وقتی که جامعه ما به سواد به بار بیایه آینده ما خراب است و به فلاکت کشنده میشه از تمام جهانیان میخوایم که استاد مثل کوه در پشت ما باشند تمام جهانیان و تمام کسایی که در دور کشور ما خارج از کشور ما زندگی میکنن احساس کنند که دختر خودشان استاد در از قسم درس از درس خواندن از آزاد زندگی کردن محروم شدن جهان و طالبا میخوایم تا مرتبه را برای دختران آواز کنم و ما حق داریم که درس بخوریم Thank you so much, Parastu, for your really moving words and for reminding us all of um, what it actually means um, to, to go through this experience, to be displaced, and, um, and, um, yeah, and, and what the reality for refugees um, may or may not look like. And also for this movie that um, I think gave us a, a very brief idea of, of what um, your organization has managed to, to do impressively. Um, we heard about so many different things now. I think it's time for our audience to also um, engage with us. Um, I know we, we have had uh, like many different aspects um, and tackled and touched upon them briefly already. So now we would like to ask you answering, to answer us another Mentimeter question. And we hope that um, after this first round, you might, and also obviously having listened to the first panel, you might have an idea if each of you would become European Commissioner for Migration and Home Affairs right now, what would the one thing be that you would do? A one million dollar question, but we really look forward to some ideas and some creativity hopefully here in the room. Bring cities and local authorities to the table, learn from their experience. Okay, stop supporting Israel to have more Palestinian refugees. Oh my God. Shall we give it a few more minutes? I don't think we have mm, more answers coming. Oh, and there we have another one. Okay, this is a broad variety of answers. <laughs> and we probably need hours to discuss all of these, but uh, thanks, thanks for, for all of your contributions. Um, let's see if we can take up some of them during the discussion, which is already, I think, um, I think we have a, a challenge of having like a very broad um, panel in terms of 
um, ideas proposed and solutions proposed. But probably also already after the first panel, it became clear that um, we are faced with a variety of challenges happening at the same time, being interconnected feeding into each other. So the question in how far, in how far I mean, we, we learned in the first panel that migration and this like, uh, how did John call it, nativism is like the one uh, red thread that is kind of connecting all far right movements, right? So, so migration in a way is the elephant in the room or not even an elephant like openly um, spoken about and, um, and misused. Um, we heard a lot about fear and emotions. On the one hand, at the on the other hand, we have a lot of um, actual challenges to to tackle. We have policy challenges. <laughs> we have politics that that have to change. So it is a very complex and and broad um, and broad picture. But um, I kind of want to ask you on on the panel, whoever feels uh, ready to to answer that to. Really, how can we reclaim the topic of, of migration and asylum? I mean, we have heard, um, I don't know, one of our panelists said earlier this morning, there is no problem, actually. And this is something I, I very much would like to further dig into. Like, I mean, on the one hand, I think every um, th there is still this consensus that... Um, you know, we cannot let people drown in the Mediterranean, obviously. We have some lessons learned from history. All of us uh, might become, at any point in history, refugees ourselves. I mean, some, some very basic rules that I think still the majority um, of, of people in, in the various countries we live in agree to. So why then all this, like how can we, what can we do to, to really get back to, to the very core of there is no real problem? I feel um, a bit of a problem of uh, the civil society is uh, that it kind of thrives on having issues to solve, you know? I think we, we kind of need problems in order to exist. And uh, then when we have this illusion that we maybe fixed some problems or that they have changed. And interestingly enough, as we were talking informally yesterday, oftentimes these problems actually do change for the better during the right-wing government rules. Uh, then we are kind of lost. But I think uh, there is also a big uh, danger of solidifying our work and kind of becoming mentally and procedurally lazy. And from that perspective, uh, things can start seeming better or easier. So I feel that we really need to constantly go back to the principles of grassroots. And I, when I say grassroots, I don't necessarily mean, uh, you know, no budget fit in the mud approach, which I respect, uh, but uh, also in terms of like constantly reinventing what we do. For example, uh, I was guilty at some point uh, of my life of uh, creating a bit of a monster. It was called uh, Are You Serious Daily News Digest. It was me in my room doing it for a while, then it became a team. The idea of that was uh, when the entire thing exploded in 2015 and there was no communication between the people who were trying to support people on the move. And I was like, okay, I'm a journalist, I know this shit. I mean, I, I can, can I say this in the... You know, if I know to do something, it's like how to deal with information. So I was like, okay, let's, you know, create a platform to share information. Because, you know, uh, volunteers in Idomedi had no idea what the volunteers in Belgrade were doing, etc. And it, I think it served its purpose for a while. It, it actually became quite big. But then it became redundant. The next thing was, okay, you know, we connected many of us, not me specifically, but like we connected, you know, we networked, we connected actors on the ground. So I guess what we need to do now is a bit of advocacy, but not, you know, Brussels-based, Brussels-oriented echo bubble. So through BVMN, which I was happy to be part of, and there are still some colleagues here who, who persist in BVMN, and I wish you all the best. Uh, we created an advocacy platform that really tried to do 
to follow the logic of what Arius Sirius was doing with the news, like really bring information from the ground to policymakers, shortcut the entire, you know, uh, big NGO uh, monopoly. And I think we did succeed. And I think, especially now after the new pact, uh, this might also become redundant at some point in the shape that it is now. And I'm not saying this, you know, from any sort of uh, like negative or spiteful perspective. On the contrary, I think our goal needs to be to become redundant because we need to constantly reinvent what we are doing and to do it from the scratch in order to stay relevant. So now, in terms of what is happening, you know, with the EU elections, maybe the next, you know, uh, short uh, cut between information should be between the general voters and the politicians, because I feel these ties are severed. And this is the issue that is that we are facing. Right wing is not facing it that much. They are very well tuned to the, you know, feelings and needs of the ordinary people, so to speak. And this means constantly engaging in humbling emotional labor of asking those who are affected. Talking to refugees instead of assuming, talking to what we like to call economic migrants in the West. Talking to European citizens, but also talking to those who are not European citizens and are very much affected by European politics and have a lot to say when it comes to topic of migration. For example, people living in the so-called Western Balkans, which is, as somebody rightfully pointed out, a social construct or political construct. I was a refugee myself. I grew up as a war kid uh, on the front line. Uh, when my sister was born in the middle of bombing, I didn't see her or my mother for two weeks because uh, she had a labor in the basement of completely destroyed hospital. There are people here in this room who survived the siege of Sarajevo, who fought in the war, who were refugees of war my friends from Bosnia. None of us, despite of the experience we had, can assume that because of the experience we had in a completely different social and historical moment, understand what people who are affected by similar things now are experiencing. We cannot assume what they need. We cannot assume what they want. And if we fall in a trap of assuming, then of course the battle is lost and we cannot assume what the average voter needs and thinks because we are not average voters. And this is why I think it's important to have people like Parasto and her voice being centered. But also, I think we need to speak to people outside of our bubble. We need to speak to right wing to understand them, not to agree with them. We need to speak with that huge electorate of general audience, which is in between the extremes, because they are the ones whose votes we can swing, and we should do that. Um, yes, I totally agree. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think that um, that's something that I usually say as well, like um, for, for the line of work I'm in, like that we should, in an ideal world, we should be irrelevant um, the way that things are. But in all honesty, I believe that civil society <laughs> alone cannot like bring the change we want to see in the world, right? Um, you need, it takes two to tango, like the bottom-up approach works, but you need to, um, you, ne you need a, a political system that's a bit more responsive to the calls of um, civil society and society in general. Um, now, as far as civil society is concerned, um, I think that one thing that could happen, um, so that you can approach the people that are potentially lured by right to extreme right wing um, movements and, and populist choices. One thing that uh, civil society could do could be to like actually become more populist ourselves. And populism is not a bad thing by default, right? It depends how you use the term populism. Um, I mean, politics, populism is an essential aspect of pop politics. You can't have politics without populism. Again, I don't mean populism uh, as, as uh, uh, probably someone like, you know, uh, like a Trumpist. 
I mean it more like, uh, I don't know, the approach that, I don't know, Chantal Mouffe has, has developed uh, as, as an academic. Um, so, A, I think that civil society should become more populist, should talk the language that the average layman person can understand and can relate to. And they each, we should also learn to, to connect very important and possibly legally uh, complex issues to, we need to like create connection between such issues and like the daily uh, life and the daily effects um, of, of, um, of people. It is a hard job. I don't know how to do it, to be honest with you. I mean, especially in, in my line of work. I mean, we work a lot on, you know, um, um, legislation. We work a lot on uh, political party financing. We work a lot on asset declarations, transparency issues. You know, all these things can, rule of law. Um, all these things can be very abstract to the average person, maybe. They can be a bit distant. You know, many times they're like, you know, I, I've heard people telling me, like, I mean, who gives a damn about X, Y law? Like, I can't make ends meet at, at home. I can't, like, buy my food in the supermarket. And you're talking about, like, I don't know what, uh, abstract concepts of uh, rule of law. So our task is to make this person understand that without a solid rule of law, I mean, probably the fact that we don't have a solid rule of law, and probably because uh, we have a lot of nepotism, probably because uh, there's a lot of corruption, prices are as high as they are, or the economy is lagging behind. So it's, 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 the bottom line is that we need to create connections between complex issues and day-to-day -day, um, issues, and we need to be a bit more um, populist. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. Apparently, it works. So if, if the right wing is doing it, maybe we should you know, not be as elitist. Try and get some things off them, like not the content, obviously, of, their, of what they're saying, but the, the, the approach that, uh, that they use. Yeah, just... <laughs> Thank you, someone over there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just shortly um, regarding our perception of the whole scenario, I think uh, it would probably be important to um, not overestimate the um, ultra right. Uh, I think that comes up a lot that we overestimate how like their their ability to convey their message simply or whatever. Uh, the nationalistic stance they defend this nativist uh, nationalistic stance is a smokescreen. There is nothing national about the national state. It's trans it has been co-opted by transnational capital for a long time. So. In in a way, th these people that's what they def they defend. They are not they they say they're for the people, but th that's not what they defend. So if we really believe that in their discourse is just like something, it's just emptiness because it's not really it doesn't correspond to reality. We can maybe start stop overestimating them, and we shouldn't overestimate ourselves, but we should uh, see what we do also as civil society um, engage in these uh, topics as uh, powerful. I think there's a lot of power in all these movements and all these organizations. And of course, it needs uh, more coordination, more uh, less overlapping maybe, and stuff like that. But it's, um, there is also power in what we do. and. Uh, I think also, on the other hand, a little bit of overestimation of their of of, of their messages. Thank you, Tiago. Paras, too. Can you hear us? I can. It is getting really interesting. I am really a little bit jealous. Why am I not there? We wish you were. Do you, do you want to, to add to this? I have many more questions. Uh, I really don't have any answer to this, that what can be done rather than uh, 
to be ta- the right decision to be taken. As uh, it was my first lesson that I learned in there that everything have to be in its own place. Uh, I'm particularly speaking about my own country, the people that they are leading uh, the country and uh, uh, many governments in Europe are trying to st- st- stand with them and sit with them. For example, Norway is really uh, highly appreciating the Taliban and they're sitting with them. They are making, uh, they are giving them the Schengen visa and inviting them to the Europe. And uh, uh, they ignore all the policies that we have been victim of it directly. So, and they have been the reason for all those immigrants came to to, uh, Europe and many other things are going to happen, but I'm not trying to be so disappointing. But I think uh, we should stand and uh, question their their decisions, question their policies and ask them why they are doing that, while they understand that it can be very dangerous for all of us. That's all I can say now. I think I'd like to invite you. I, I mean, we have the pleasure of having really experienced people here um, from the various fields. And I think I would really like to ask you for concrete examples now, because we, we can discuss, I mean, shall we become more populist? Shall we become, you know, shall we, um, you know, steal from the, the, the far right? Shall we steal their methods um, with our own contents, obviously? Or, um, you know, do we, do we um, approach other policy fields? Um, you know, it's, is it uh, social justice stupid, not migration? And the, I, I, think, I think we won't reach the answer, but do you have like concrete examples of something you did? Milena, you started talking about this a little bit, like a very hands-on experience of something you did that worked well, that might be maybe copied or like, you know, just used as an inspiration by others. Or the opposite, do you have something you tried? Like, have you tried being populist and, and failed and, <laughs> you know, know, know this one door, like don't knock at this door, it's, it's a failure for sure? Like, Anything to share with us? Uh, we managed to be populist uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, at the beginning of uh, Are You Serious? Uh, our work in Croatia actually started off as being deliberately populist because we were aware how easily uh, the migration narrative can swing. You know, they were refugees and then they were migrants, then economic migrants, you know and you know how the entire semantic issue developed. And uh, we knew, okay, you know, this won't last long, but uh, maybe we can seize the moment and at least for a brief moment of time make it right. So what we were saying, and there were a lot of us in the beginning of the NGO who were quite savvy in communication and maybe even played it a bit dirty because we uh, were insisting on speaking in the media in terms of we were the victims of war once, you know, really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a right-wing narrative in Croatia, actually. We were the victims of war once. It is a matter of national pride to support those who are living through this experience now. Uh, we believed it, but the way we framed it was extremely populist. And uh, it really resulted uh, with overwhelming support from the ordinary citizens. In the first year, I would say almost a year, maybe like nine months, uh, when almost a million people passed through our country, uh, there was this overwhelming sense of all national support where we were, you know, jumping in the cars of unknown people, going to the borders, stopping at the random house of a granny who was, you know, preparing sandwiches all day for us to bring to the people who were transiting by trains. Uh, even today, when I think about it, I'm moved, you know, by this unity of Croatian society in support of refugees. What changed then... Uh, I would say wider European politics changed. Uh, there was this uh, infamous meeting uh, in Vienna of the Ministers of Interior in March 2016, which triggered the, this domino effect of closing the borders. And it unfortunately coincided with the 
parliamentary and presidential elections in Croatia, where the right-wing narrative of you know, security, criminalization was introduced. It was a copy-paste uh, Hungarian model. And uh, not only our politicians learned rhetorics from the Orban regime, our police also learned the violent uh, uh, tactics of the torture that was then happening at uh, the Hungarian borders, as Andras likes to point out, the poison of uh, <laughs> the poison of pushbacks <laughs> started in Hungary. Uh, I think then we failed to seize the moment and to really uh, have deeper, more meaningful conversation with what was perceived as the left parties in Croatia then, and to try to force them to continue using simple narrative, to, to, to not to just give the topic to the right wing as they unfortunately did. But what I'm trying to say in terms of populism, there are ways, you know, maybe less crude than what we did at the time, but there are still, I think, ways to swing public opinion. And I think this is just part of the struggle. I think we also need to be aware of the fact that we are different people with different beliefs, different targets. And that doesn't mean that the other person is wrong. I equally believe in you know, hands-on approach in the field, in uh, doing uh, the pro-refugee propaganda, and in strategic litigation, for example. I think, as we were discussing last night also, that you know, fighting against criminalization of movement can go in parallel with fighting against the criminalization of solidarity. They are different topics, but they're all, I would say, symptomatic of how our governments and how our countries are going to, you know, shall not use the word. So uh, I really, really feel that even if there are disagreements among us on how political struggle and how politics and how activism should work, what we must avoid to do is saying, like, my activism is better than yours. Because right wing is not doing that, at least not to that extent. Well, I think uh, from the perspective of alarm phone, um, I could say there is something uh, that worked. I don't know in which sense, but as a um, witness to what is happening, uh, it is highly important to have witnesses and not have a blackout of information of what is happening in uh, the Mediterranean and beyond. Um, I'm saying this because I think it's important, not because I think it worked in a concrete way uh, towards uh, policymakers. Um, on the other hand, uh, from the city to the city, um, it's a very special work because it's not also not uh, aiming at very concrete outcomes, but uh, a more meta outcome of turning a transnational local authority network into a political actor, for example. Um, that I, I would not say that worked yet, but we keep working on it. We, are, uh, we have uh, managed to take uh, 10 municipalities last year to Brussels uh, from seven different countries. Co colleagues from Amsterdam, Zagreb uh, are here. They were there. Um, uh, they were heard. It was in, it was a very interesting uh, process. Um, again, it didn't have the outcome of uh, them being incorporated as a, a, a EU body to have direct uh, exchange uh, uh, for policy making, which is ideally what we would uh, aim for. But um, it was for sure uh, a valid valid step, which we will uh, continue to uh, work on. So I would leave it at that. All right, so pop up. Oh. So practical examples, I mean, we, we don't work on, I don't work on migration per se. Um, so I'm gonna try and give examples that might be potentially used uh, on different fields. The first thing, um, unfortunately, being populist is not easy. 
right? Uh, I wish I wish we could do it that easily, especially when you are like um, a, an NGO such as a, such as ours, like a democracy watchdog organization that has to sort of be nonpartisan. We sort of have to be a bit serious. We need to be a bit institutional when talking to parliaments or politicians and the like. But since we couldn't be populist, we decided to be pop, <laughs> right? So, you know, we're not being populist, we're being popular. So a, a way to achieve this is, I mean, the way we've done it. First of all, obviously, communication is key. Um, we deal with, like, very boring issues to the average person, I must say, sometimes to me, myself as well. Um, you know, I mean, going through laws and it can be boring. Um, but... The way we communicate our findings, the way we communicate our work, uh, the way we visualize our data, the way we do all these things is, is tailor-made for, for like a sort of audience that is a bit more fresh and youthful. So we, we're trying to sort of, um, you know, um, wrap something that might be a bit ugly and boring with like colorful things um, to make it more attractive. And that's a way to get a message across to an audience that might not be that um, interesting. Um, secondly, what we do also is that we try to sort of advance otherwise abstract or maybe complex issues um, by connecting them to actual cases, cases that are being discussed in the news or whatever. For instance, um, we at Woolly Watch, among other things, we actively campaign for the right to information, right? Um, fund the, uh, like it's, it's a very important right for every sort of democracy that wants to call itself a democracy. Now, how do we do that? We're not just sending letters to the MPs and the, P, and the, P, and the PMs and the ministers and, you know, or policy papers. We do that too. But the other thing we do is that we, we try to like use this right in, within every uh, campaign of ours. Um, for instance, uh, a few years ago during the COVID lockdown, uh, the Greek government decided to allocate vast amounts of money to uh, media outlets to carry the stay at home campaign message, which, you know, it's something that happened across Europe. The problem here in Greece was that the way it happened was super intransparent. Um, and because of the state of the media freedom in Greece, um, uh, you know, of the media landscape in Greece, we were a bit suspicious that something something lies behind it. So, how did we connect this issue, which was widely discussed in, par in, in, in society, with the access to information? Well, we submitted an access to information request asking for the ministry to provide us with information regarding these transactions. And, you know, and then we, we, we did a campaign whereby we asked, we prepared the template and we asked citizens to like bombard the ministry with the same sort of um, message. So they got engaged in this process. We received, they, the ministry probably received around 350, 400 access to information requests asking for the same thing. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna say that the, the, this, this scandal came about because of our work only, but I think that we did um, do something towards, you know, we, we did influence the, 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 the process. And most, most of all, we made some people, at least, understand what's the importance of, of an abstract, otherwise abstract concept and how it can be sort of, you know, useful on the ground uh, to tackle with um, real issues. And thirdly, another thing that you can, one can do to sort of uh, mobilize, inspire, etc., is to fight. Fight. Don't be afraid to fight. Um, by fighting, you set an example that you can stand up to seemingly authorities, entities, and institutions that are bigger than you. Uh, and when I say fight, I mean fight within, obviously, the uh, confines of uh, you know, the law, uh, not actually guerrilla. Um, maybe that's why I'm not getting claps, because if people think that I'm like, a, you know... Um, <laughs> I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished. <laughs> uh, no, so no, 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 not actual fighting, but you know, use all, all all legal means available. So we do a lot of strategic litigation. Um, 
like to the extent where people are like, I mean, the authorities and ministries are sort of like, oh my God, them again. Like they'll think we like going to court. We don't really like going to court, but it is a way for us to sort of show the government that, hey, we're watching you and we're not gonna just write an article about the crap you're doing, but we're actually gonna like, you know, fight it in the court. And secondly, we're, I want to believe that we're setting an example to other civil society organizations or individuals that want to sort of, um, you know, challenge um, the, 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 the system and find justice, basically. So, you know, these points, be pop, um, you know, try to find clever ways to connect abstract terms that you're fighting for, adv advocating for to practical issues and fighting. Thank you. Maybe I just want to compliment with something. Um, I mean, I don't want to talk in name of cities, but we work with them. So we see also uh, very good examples that they develop in their own territory. So another thing that we did was a conference uh, in the frame of a, a EU funded project. Uh, we uh, went to Brussels and then afterwards we went to Villeurbanne. Um, uh, close to Lyon, um, and they they developed, for example, a CD card. So this is something that is being like there are shared um, ex ex um, knowledge exchange around a CD card, which would grant irregular migrants uh, some basic rights. Uh, Barcelona had done something similar, for example. Um, by um, allowing people to register, uh, although they would they wouldn't even have an address, uh, fixed address, so they would register to and with this registration paper, they uh, it's a national law. They get access to uh, public health and uh, school for the children. So this is very this is very concrete measures that uh, cities uh, put in place to um, to yeah circumvent what the, the state is doing. Um, and then uh, just to go back a little bit to your argument about capital, which uh, I agree totally. And uh, f for instance, one of the main problems that uh, we see cities face is housing. So this is like the he biggest problem uh, right now is housing. And uh, many people use this to, to play some people against other people and say, well, there is not enough housing for everyone, so we cannot take any more people. Um, that is capital. It's capital who took over the housing market. It's, it's, it's not the refugees that are taking housing from, from uh, people. It's capital that did this. It's the system that is designed for uh, people to be in shortages and um, and so this is also something very concrete which solu there are some solutions which is building uh, houses with a percentage for uh, social housing or even directly uh, for refugees and other uh, models that cities develop um, but I would say would ha we would have to go deeper into this and uh, there are many organizations that are already fighting this. Um, for example, in Berlin there was an organization that was uh, trying to expropriate um, uh, housing to, to put it back on, on the public uh, um, uh, offer. So yeah, I think there are concrete things happening and not necessarily in the domain of migration, but uh, that uh, can be uh, very good allies also. Thanks a lot. I think this was anyways um, also the, the attempt to zoom out a little bit of this like narrow migration and asylum discussion as it does not make that much sense. The way we see it, things are interconnected and, and we always have to um, see, see the holistic policies or questions or challenges. Um, so thanks for all these ideas. Thanks for also stressing that we are fighting within a nonviolent uh, democratic way, Stephanus. Um, Palastu, is there anything you want to share? Because I, I would really also like to, I mean, we're running out of time, so I would really also like to um, invite our, our, our audience to um, engage um, in the discussion. So anything you would like to share with us? So uh, I just... Uh, 
want to thank you first of all for having me here. It was really an honor to speak here and to be a voice of Afghanistan here and also an immigrant. Do not forget that we are also suffering and with all the situation that the, the different cultures that we have to settle within, we have to be like, like water to be put it in any kind of place and have get the shape of it. We are trying our best to make this place, these places that we have been to as immigrants, our houses, and we are trying to be the best citizens as we can. And uh, at the same time, let's do not forget to stand in the right side of history and call the bad people the bad people and the good people good ones. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. So I would finally invite you to, I know we had a long morning already, so we all might need some coffee, but we have a question in the back. I think it's a very large discussion, but again, all the panels were somehow designed where the Q&A will be very brief, so people are asked to be brief. So I'll try to be brief. So if I cut some people off, I'm very sorry. Um, without instigating any negative uh, retaliation or discussions. One thing that, although that I hear most of it, like two things that really sticks with me is what Milena says about assumption. Assumption also goes for not for like migrants, refugees, people on the move, but also for co-citizens or the public image. And something that I kindly, kind of disagree with what uh, was spoken about, rule of law being abstract. I think rule of law, today to quote unquote the, you know, the daily people, it's super easy to understand because it's super easy to breach. We talk about, yeah, we talk about rule of law within Europe, our values, all that. But at the same time, we haven't talked anything about, although that we saw the watermelons about the ICJ ruling about Palestine. So the institutions that were created, such as European Court of Human Rights and how its rulings are being desecrated by Turkey while deals such as EU-Turkey deal are being signed in exchange of, somehow we all know this, letting go of the political issues and the political prisoners that are, or like atrocities of human rights are taking place. Same goes with what's happening in Gaza right now or even uh, in West Bank. So I think what is very easy to say is that we do not recognize when rule of law is being breached and we also do not amplify the voice of people who want to say something against this. And I think the demonstrations that was taking place all over the global north these days about Palestine is a proof of it. So I do not necessarily find it so accurate to say that these are abstract terms. It's just in specific places, we deliberately choose not to speak about them or ignore them. So that also goes with like what resonates with me about, you know, Milena, what you say about assumption. Uh, there is definitely an empathetical connection that we can carry based on our story. Storytelling is very important. While I agree with you, because it's, that assumption goes with the fact, for instance, what potentially displaced Parasto from where she lived or she wishes to live, is also majority of the people, from what I can judge here, is coming from countries where wars and interventions or occupations were also responsible of. We, as citizens of these countries, our governments, our states, or our supranational bodies, mainly based on security, quote unquote, invaded these countries, or in better words, occupied uh, the territories of these livelihoods of these people. They benefited from that, and they're also benefiting from pushing people away from reaching to shelter and safety like Parashto. So let's also do not ignore the fact that war is very profitable business, so does denying people the safety, the dignity that they seek, because that is also war. When we talk about pushbacks, we talk about boats, we talk about surveillance systems, we talk about tech mad beyond our imagination, we talk about fences, we talk about border guards. So that's also quite a good business. So maybe when we talk about rule of law and capitalism, we can also maybe think a bit self-critically about what we want to mean by all of these concepts. I just made some thoughts while listening to you, and uh, I will be very brief. 
One point is that personally I feel very discredited uh, from uh, politics and politicians. So I think this is something also to consider while um, thinking how we can be part of uh, policy making, what it means to today to be uh, voting or what mean elections. It seems that uh, it doesn't mean a lot anymore for many people. So if you want to connect in this way and build on that, you also have to step back and uh, consider this um, and question what, what value it actually has for citizens today. Because if it doesn't have, it cannot have an outcome that uh, is really meaningful to the society. And another thing about... Uh, the title of this uh, Congress, Rethinking Migration. I think uh, within rethinking, it uh, covers also rethinking uh, our position together with migrants. And I feel that um, most of the time we speak as still, even here we are in solidarity and we are close, even I feel still we are speaking as separate, separation, as the privileged, let's say, um, yes, a little bit. I would like it to be more uh, something common. When we say we, it should be the habitants of a place. When we speak about local uh, fights, it has to be the fights really being done together and for everyone. And this should include housing, rights, uh, we said, uh, to information or anything. So if we, if we don't start um, seeing ourselves as a whole and not separate with words and actions, um, we will not get very far, I fear. Thank you. Because in the panel, in the first panel in the morning, we discussed about like how the narrative of the far right won, but maybe not necessarily the battle. And then you mentioned, based on information theory, how I forgot the two categories you mentioned, but I fall in the second one. But I want to give you an example to pick up your brain on how to like simplify a fact-based uh, or data-based approach to this by giving you an example from Turkey. So the far, well, we have a very small far right in Turkey, but they go with the simple, for example, um, fact, quote unquote, that says the number of Syrians, and they play the demographic threat when they talk about Syrians in Turkey, saying that they, there will be 20 million Syrians within 15 years from now, and we're going to become a minority. So my job as someone who work in migration and like, you know, I'd like to play with numbers and whatnot, like I had to like sit down and like, like dismantle this scientifically. And then like I decided recently to like forget about this and say the simple fact that there are less Syrians now in Turkey compared to the number of Syrians six years ago. So that is by default, like, you know, dismantling the argument of the far right. But it's so simple that now it is decoded in the minds of millions of Turks that like it's called silent invasion now. Like we are under silent invasion. So how could someone, as we, if you want to call us, or like, you know, those who are involved in academia or like, you know, in science, use the right information to combat misinformation that is spreading in a very simple way exactly the far right is, has been utilizing so far in Turkey or elsewhere in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I do agree with you. Uh, I mean, these two types of narratives, the uh, delay narrative and technocrat narrative, there are also many other distinctions when it comes to communication. They have like sub-brackets, I think five or six sub-brackets, which are opposed to each other. And one of the sub-brackets is facts versus non-facts. So I don't think we should necessarily, you know, take the negatives of the sub brackets. But what I was trying to say is that uh, we should still uh, speak uh, like a common language, so to speak, in order to talk to those whose votes we can swing or whose opinions we can swing. So I loved your example uh, with the number of Syrians. 
Uh, I, I had the sa similar situation a lot of times uh, when asked in Croatian media. Uh, there was this, at, at certain point, there was this idea of like we are being, you know, overrun almost by the type of, of, of by the number of refugees. Uh, and I live in an apartment building which is eight, 18 or 16 stories high. And I would usually just say at the moment there are less asylum seekers in Croatia than the number of people who live in my building. So I feel we can be, you know, fact-based and at the same time to communicate in a way that is accessible for everyone. And uh, I'm no big academic. Uh, to my shame, I studied for 13 years. But uh, <laughs> I really feel that uh, scientific mastery and academic mastery is achieved when you are able to relay the complexity of information and insight you have to everyone who is sitting in front of you. Thank you for this inspiring conversation. Thank you, Milena, for pointing out that we tend to pick each other apart rather than lifting each other up. And I've heard some of that in the past few days, and it's very sad to see that we do this. I'm also very um, surprised and a little bit alarmed at the level of violence in the language that I've heard in the past uh, couple of days. Just today, you know, if I was the commissioner, I would kill myself. I am alarmed at that. I think there's a lot of trauma and um, a lot of mental health conversations that we're not having that would really help us to be able to lift each other up because we're not going to be able to do that if we cannot support ourselves. So thank you for pointing that out, that that is something that, um, that we need to work on and be better and do better at. Um, I wanted to um, react to something that Stefano said because I've been thinking about the point of populism and I find it very interesting because the definition, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is uh, so also like uh, qualifying where the knowledge comes from, a political approach that strives to appeal to ordinary people who feel that their concerns are disregarded by established elite groups. And I think this is how a lot of people that I speak to that are not in my green bubble feel about democracy at large. That's how they feel about representative democracy. Um, the question of Ahmad about Eastern Germany, um, being myself from Eastern Germany, having been born shortly before the wall came down, I always say to people, I'm a first generation Democrat because my parents grew up in socialism. So for me to understand and to communicate about democracy is really important as a concept, no matter which party you know someone votes for. But this is what I hear a lot in my extended family in Eastern Germany is that they up there don't care about us, so let's vote for someone who will stick it to them. Because it's not about solutions, it's not about what policies they put forth, it's about really sticking it to the so-called elite. And for a lot of people, the elite is anyone who is involved in institutions. And I think there's been this sentiment also you know, that I've heard uh, over the past two days, which I can understand, but it's important to examine that and really dismantle it. Thank you for raising the point about Palestine. This is something that we feel every day in our work in, in Lebanon and with our Syrian partners. We need to be able to answer to human rights defenders from other parts of the world that we usually support and work with that now we don't have good answers for with the current situation in Palestine. So I think we are having a lot of these questions that we need to ask ourselves and that we need to actually examine and strengthen democracy from the inside. I loved what you said, Stefanos, about being an active citizen. I think that is something that can really be a key tool to coming together and working together and striving to understand how different approaches can lead to a stronger democracy. Because for me, it's not at all a given. And thank you also to Parasto for being here, even if it's just online, but you are so powerful. Your words are so strong. Thank you. Actually, this felt like a very good wrap up already, but we have more questions. In Can I go? Uh, yes, please. I would like to uh, speak uh, with, based on my experience, because I have been, uh, I arrived in 2006 in Greece uh, with, with, uh, with a boat from uh, Turkey. Eight years have been in uh, different countries, and I feel myself today as a really lucky person 
is for us to be our two lucky refugees that we are here in a, yeah, in a safe place. Taking in consideration this, I think there are like two uh, narratives that uh, shape somehow the policies. One is like far right that they say, no, they are uh, coming, they are replacing us, etc. So this far right uh, narrative and from other side, like the left or people, uh, civil society organization that they say, yeah, uh, let us welcome them and etc. But where is, I think, our role on the third narrative, the narrative made shaped by themselves re uh, refugee, I mean. There is no place, no space. And when we start to really ensure this is space for migrants, for people with migration background, with experience, to shape this uh, narrative. Otherwise, I think we will be here in, of, in 10 years, and again we will speak that migration uh, displacement will be a problem. So, because narrative shapes the policies. Second thing here, I think in this room, how many people have lived experience? If we continue to give recommendation from our side that we have no idea what it means to be on a ship, what it means to be in a reception center, what it means to go to, to start a procedure, what it means I have been last week for, to renew my uh, um, travel document as a refugee. Immigration office has, in, I mean in Rome, it's like a trauma place. What it means to go there and to still be like, to struggle. So uh, I think if we don't receive recommendations, we don't give space to people with lived experience, that they bring their perspective, that look, this is not working in this way. I know that you, you, you want to welcome me, but this is not the way to, uh, uh, to make policies, the rules. I mean from the rules of a reception center till the like high level, uh, till uh, European Parliament or European level policies, the policy making processes, I mean. We have, do not have any contribution. So this, again, I mean that in 10 years we will be again if we don't ensure this uh, space for people with lived experience. And the third thing, I think it is linked to my second point about democracy. Uh, I think there is a big gap in uh, political participation of people with migration background. So I think we need to take in consideration this. In Italy, we have around 5 million people uh, migrant people living, and we have no uh, way, no uh, possibility to contribute in, uh, in, the, in the political life. So this gap, I think we need to somehow repair this gap, otherwise we will continue to have far right and other people that they speak on behalf of migrants and refugees, and especially it is, it is some, uh, somehow facilitate that narrative uh, of, of far right, because they don't see any people with deep experience in front line that they speak on their behalf, that they bring uh, uh, their perspective, that they are part participating in our, contributing in our society. So this is, I think, really important to somehow uh, uh, think of, uh, of this gap in, in political uh, participation in, in, in the political and democratic system of, uh, of Europe. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. I, I, I'm afraid we are running out a bit of time. I mean, we are already... Um, it's already qu a quarter to two. Um, so we have two more questions where all of you can answer. And it's very much related to, I mean, it's, it's also related to what you were saying. So hopefully um, this will gather, help gather some more voices if our technicians would be so kind to um, give us our two last Mentimeter questions. And uh, we can see actually to rethink migration in Europe, more focus should be placed on, and then you were just arguing for um, people with a refugee experience themselves, but we have also the institutional level, civil society, narratives and media, or all of the above. So maybe you feel like sharing your opinions.
have a clear winner here, but oh, it's a close. Thanks. Thank you all. I think that's a clear picture. Um, if you don't read the text, we seem quite polarized. <laughs> <laughs> well, or we have two areas to focus on. <laughs> or in that sense, we focus on all of them. Oh, exactly. <laughs> it's, yeah, but I think this is, uh, this is also food for thought. I mean, for all of us looking into, because we, we all are scarce with our resources, and I guess so, um, or as Anna also said, also tired and, and sometimes uh, really uh, working beyond our, our resources and capacity. So thanks for that. Um, we have one last, I promise it's the last. Um, if you feel like clicking one more time, which is looking into the future, uh, migration in Europe. 20 something years from now, will it be accepted in a, as a reality and um, not of an issue or still on the agenda as a challenge? And also here we see a clear, yeah. Apart from climate crisis and everything else ongoing, I mean, like, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have still lots to do. This is a clear sign and a clear, uh, clear vote, I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you also for <laughs> bravely answering all these. And for keeping with the intensive discussion um, this morning. We won't let you go before we, we, don't, we haven't shown you one more quote of our namesake, which in that sense, obviously, Heinrich Böll, when he said um, that our century, which was his century, which was the last century, of course, um, would be called um, the century of refugees. He was obviously coming from the experience of having lived two world wars. But um, I find this very striking as nowadays, I mean, we have exceeded all existing numbers of refugees and, and people being displaced worldwide yet again this year. I mean, this is something that we, have, we are witnessing for a couple of years in a row now. And uh, I think it's good to remind ourselves that being here in Europe or in, a, I mean, someone mentioned the cradle of uh, democracy, all this, like, uh, this, is, this is very recent, and it's also our common history, and it's ongoing, and it's, it keeps affecting different people, but um, I think in that very spirit, we are living the next century of refugees, and um, I think it's good to remind ourselves of that, and uh, yeah, keep this thought with us. So, thanks a lot for your attention.